Shall we begin with uh, Thomas Merton's uh, prayer of abandonment? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I cannot see the road ahead of me, and I do not know for certain where it will end. Nor do I know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to love as Christ has loved does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear. For you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. So, we have a big evening ahead of us. A lot of work to do. And uh, I think it's important, you know, to think in terms of the fact that, 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 uh, I'm really here only for, for a weekend, and uh, this is primarily input, huh? and that the idea is after it's over to hopefully to think about it and get together and to discuss it, but the idea is at this moment in time to, to try to get a, the best sense possible of, of, of the uh, totality of the theology of Christian nonviolence. And so, in order to do that, one of the things that it seemed to me important to do is to <coughs> reflect on a few phenomena from Scripture that uh, that are somehow central to the understanding of what Jesus was about. Now, I think you and I, and we all have to be clear that our first task, our first task, is to find out what, in fact, the gospel says. And to try to be clear in our own minds that what we are about is not making the gospel say what we want it to say. There's a real danger there. Our task is to find out what, in fact, the gospel says. That one of the things to be very, very conscious of is, of course, that the gospel, Jesus' words, and Jesus' understanding of what is God's will, Jesus' revelation is not authoritative on unauthoritative, depending upon whether I like it or not. I may not like what Jesus has to say about lust, but that doesn't change the authority of what he has to say. The authority of a moral teaching is, of course, no better than the authority of the person who is presenting it. And therefore, once again, the question comes down to faith. Who is Jesus? If Jesus is God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the self-revelation of God, the ultimate revealer of God's will, then his authority simply cannot be questioned. If he's another holy man from the East, no problem questioning holy men from the East. 
all holy women. What is it that the gospel, in fact, says versus what do I want it to say? As I look at the gospel, the first word out of Jesus' mouth in his public ministry, the very first word out of Jesus' mouth in his public ministry is the word repent. Greek, noia, which means change of mind, literally. The very first word out of Jesus' mouth is repent. Metanoia, change of mind. As I look at the Sermon on the Mount, it seems to me that as I read it anyway, there is a certain psychological presupposition about the nature of reality that is embodied in it. For when Jesus says, you have learned how it was said of old, you must not kill. And if anyone does kill, he must answer before the court. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister has already sinned. You have heard it said of old, you must not commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has already committed adultery with her. It seems to me that the psychological presupposition involved here is that a person becomes what he or she thinks. A person becomes what he or she thinks. That as I think, so also I will act. That is, Jesus is not saying to go out and kill. He's not saying to go out and commit adultery. What he is saying is that if I dissolve the thoughts of anger, there is no possibility that I'm ever going to reach the stage of murder. If I dissolve the thoughts of lust, there is no possibility that I am ever going to reach the point of adultery. But if I don't dissolve the thoughts of anger, if I nurture them, if I nurture and live in the thoughts of lust, then indeed I am desiring that's that which I am thinking, and it's only fear of some kind that's keeping me away from it. Or let's put it another way. What Jesus asked for in this word here, another way of translating it is conversion. Jesus' call is a call to conversion, a change of mind. Jesus' formula for achieving peace on earth, Jesus' formula for living a human life, Jesus' formula for overcoming the effects of sin is this. It's a formula of conversion where the understanding is that the mind style of a person from the mind style of the individual follows the lifestyle and when two or more people have the same lifestyle you then have a community style. Mind style to lifestyle to community style. In Orthodox Catholic theology, you are not morally responsible for any human activity that does not proceed from an intentional thought. Thought always precedes moral activity. And therefore, what Jesus is saying is, 
If you will control the thought, the behavior will automatically be controlled. Conversion is a process of changing one's mind and thereby changing one's overt behavior. And when two or more people change their overt behavior, the change of a community style. Mind style produces lifestyle, produces community style. I become what I think. And that, to a large extent, is the law that governs all of us. Now, there is another way of going about the process of, or thought to be going about, the process of bringing peace to earth. And it's not coercion, co conversion, it's coercion. All law, in other words, is based on coercion, violence. Huh? That's what we're talking about. Dominative power. Dominative power. Coercion. Coercion is concerned exclusively and primarily with the external dimensions of human existence. Coercion asks ask, ask only for behavioral change. And it does not care why the person, why the person acts in a particular way. It is only interested in that the person acts in a particular way. It is the use of fear to get particular behavior. It is the world of the law. The law looks only to external behavior. And so, what's the problem with the law as a moral guide? With that mechanism for building peace on earth? If I only alter my external behavior, on the basis that if I don't do it, I'm going to be hurt, then I still remain a murderer at heart, or a lustful person at heart, or a jealous person at heart, or an angry person at heart. And the minute, I mean the minute, I feel that I can get away with it, that I can escape the consequences of the fear, the whole disposition, the whole mind is as it was there has been no conversion. All there has been is conformity externally out of fear. And so, the process of conversion and the process of coercion are two different processes. They are two different ways of going about the human situation. One says, I don't care why you behave, I just want you to behave this way. The other says, I know that if you develop a sense of truth that says this is wrong or this is right, that that sense of truth is what you will live out of and that will determine your lifestyle and if two or more people determine it, the community style, fear will not be necessary. And so let me give you a few quotes here, just, just uh, direct statements, one sentence quotes from Father McKenzie. First, how does this read to you? Where love fails, law is no substitute. Where love fails, law is no substitute. You know what's being said? Consider this. In Mussolini's Italy, it was a felony crime to bypass another Italian in the street who was hurt, another citizen in the street who was hurt. You know, trains ran on time and all kinds of other things. Now let me give you an example. 
Italian man is walking down the street, sees a man hurt, walks by him, and says, geez, you know, if uh, someone sees me walking by this guy, I could be thrown in jail. I better help him. So he goes over and he starts to help me. He says, oh, I'm late. Tech with him. Starts to walk away. Goes back and says, you know, this could be a setup. Really a setup. You know, if I have to go to jail, I lose the job, I lose the money. Uh, I say, I'll help him. You know, he starts to help him. He says, to heck with it. This is too much. This isn't it. And he walks away again and he says, you know, we're at war. I could be drafted. I could be killed. This could really be bad if I didn't help this bum. So he goes over, picks him up, takes him down to the local hospital. What a difference between that and the Samaritan who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho, who sees a person who would otherwise be his enemy, the Jew, who recognizes that that person is suffering like he could suffer, who develops a sense of compassion, common passion with him, and who freely, without any fear, walks over and helps the man out of his own pocket, out of his own time. Externally, it looks like the same thing is happening. Internally, the people are becoming two different kinds of entities. One is becoming a more loving person, and the other is becoming a more fearful person. Where love fails, law is no substitute. What cannot be accomplished by love cannot be accomplished by law, even if you can get the same external results. How about this by McKenzie? Justice under law, justice under law is compatible with hatred. Justice under law is compatible with hatred. Of course. Two people come into court, the judge says X and Y, you pay, uh, you pay Y $5,000 X. You can have absolute justice according to any, any uh, code of jurisprudence you want to talk about, and Y and X can leave that courtroom hating each other. It is love that saves, not justice. Where there is love, there is always justice. Always. But where there is justice, there is not always love. Remember the great hymn to love, 1 Corinthians 13? If I have all the eloquence of orators of angels, but speak without love, I am nothing but a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. If I have faith in all its fullness to move mountains, and all the knowledge, and can prophesy, but in without love it will do me no good whatsoever. If I give away all that I have, piece by piece, and even if I let them take my body to burn it, but in without love, I am nothing at all. Do you realize what's happening in those passages? What's happening is St. Paul is taking the highest kind of activity, moral activity, that is imaginable. Faith. Faith. Social service to the point of giving away everything that I have, piece by piece. Now that's social service. Martyrdom. Give them my body to burn it the highest things, and he says, these, the most virtuous of activities, motivated by something other than love, worthless. And likewise, one can assume that all activities less than that, the giving of a cup of tea, if motivated by something other than love, is morally worthless. Justice, justice, without love is nothing. Where love is, justice always is. But where justice is, love does not have to be. 
And so, justice under law indeed can be compatible with hatred. Quite compatible. All this, McKinsey. If there's one person from the New Testament we can be assured has no lasting place in history, there's one person from the New per Testament we can be assured has no lasting place in history, that person is the statesman. Statesman, my God, that's the guy on television every night. He's running to Iraq, and he's over in Nigeria, and he's in Israel, and up over in Tokyo, and he's, he's got the eyewitness news following him here and there, and meetings, and the, he's at the United Nations, and this and that. And McKinsey says he has no lasting value in history, according to the New Testament. Why? The world of the statesmen is the world of dominative power, violence, fear, threat. It is love that saves, not fear, not power, not coercion. And what's the love that's meant? Famous hymn of Agape in 1 Corinthians 13, after the first paragraph describes that without love, faith is no good, martyrdom is no good, social service is no good, Religious oratory is no good. Cup of tea is no good without love. Morally worthless. The second paragraph then goes on to describe the kind of love that is meant. It says, love is always patient and kind. It is never jealous. Love is never boastful or conceited. It is never rude or selfish. It does not take offense and is not resentful. Love takes no pleasure in other people's sins, but delights in the truth. It is always ready to excuse, to trust, to hope, and to endure whatever comes. Love does not come to an end. Love is always patient and kind. Now, someone can tell me how you can do that while you're blowing off someone's head. For if Faith without love is no good. War without love is no good. And if someone can tell me how you can be a statesman, and all be willing to forgive, to endure, not deal in fear and violence and dominative power for one small group of humanity over and against all the rest of humanity. According to the New Testament, if there's one person and no lasting place in history, it's the statesman. And finally, one final sentence, and this is not precisely from Mackenzie, although it's from his writings, but he's quoting St. Thomas Aquinas. It is, imposed virtue is vice. Imposed virtue is vice. At the point that I hold a gun at your head and say, do this virtuous thing or I'm going to hurt you, and you say, sure, sure, huh? What I've done is I've simply nurtured fear in you. And fear does not save. In the New Testament, fear is the opposite of love, not hate. The great struggle that Christ reveals is the struggle between fear and love. At every dimension of reality, fear is the great inhibitor of love. And as St. John says, love cast out fear. And indeed, fear cast out love. And so what do we have here? What do we have is this. We have this kind of situation, just to loosely, you know, in terms of violence and so forth, just in a general way. We have this kind of situation. We have this person here, you know? Think about it a little bit. Human beings, all human beings, are constantly goal-oriented, huh? Goal-oriented. We want to achieve certain goals, whether that's to walk down here or to uh, get out the back door or to... Right? We're constantly goal-oriented. There occasionally arises many, many times those moments when we have a goal, we plan our means to it, 
and something frustrates our reaching the goal. Something interferes. Huh? Now at this point, there are a lot of things that a human being can do. He or she can drop the goal, just forget it, and then there's no problem. Or they can find means to go around it that might take more time or something, but there are ways. But one of the things that's possible is they can attack what they perceive to be the cause of frustration. And so I may want to uh, walk out the door there, and I'm really in a hurry, and I get to the door, and there's two chairs in front of it. Now, there's a lot of things I can do, but one of the things I can pick the chairs up and wing them out of the way. Huh? Because they are frustrating me in reaching that goal. And, or, or I, could be, uh, I could be going out to give a, uh, to give a great talk on Christian love. Huh? And uh, lo and behold, uh, what the children have done is they've, they've literally built a house in front of the door, you know, with chairs and tables and so forth, that sort of business. And so on my way out to give this talk to the United States Catholic bishops on Christian love, uh, all of a sudden the children have uh, put this here. Huh? What can I do? One thing I can do is I can become enraged at the stuff in front of the door that's going to interfere with my being on time, giving a talk to the bishops on love. Huh? Well, there's many other things I can do. The point being, huh, what happens when the goal is not so tangible as getting out a door or getting a glass of water and something interferes? Not that there are, those aren't real goals and can cause anger and so forth, violence. But what happens when the goal is happiness. I want to be happy and I'm not. Oh boy. And we've got real, because we can't pinpoint it now, can we? We can't say, ah, there's the problem. No, no. What we tend to do is, we tend to create what are called symbolic causes that frustrate our reaching the goal. The scapegoats. Poor whites in the South aren't happy. It's poor blacks in the South that are the problem. Not the robber barons. Huh? They can't even think robber baron. And so they kill the poor blacks. The United States and England and France impose upon Germany an unconscionable treaty at the end of World War I. Barbaric. The economy goes down the drain, people are suffering and so forth. And the Germans go looking for the reason, for the general malaise and unhappiness, and they find Jews. When happiness is the goal and it doesn't work out, and we're not happy, and then what? This person. Ah, there's one more level. What about if the goal is survival? I want to continue to be daily, weekly, monthly. I see things are slipping away. And then I go looking for why. A real danger, I'm going to begin to attack people because I am not happy, because I am not surviving. And John L. McKenzie says that the center, the circumference, and everything in between of the Christian life is agape, when, love. When St. Paul says, faith without love, martyrdom without love, social service without love is no good, what, what is being said is that love is the goal of the Christian life and love is the means of the Christian life. There is no way to separate the means and the ends of Christian life. It makes no difference whether I get out that door or not. What does make a difference is the spirit with which I move through my daily activities. I may or may not be a martyr. I may or may not be involved in social service or giving a cup of tea. There are a million and one things, a trillion and one things that people must do movement to movement, second to second. 
But the goal of the Christian life is to love, and the only way to reach that goal is by doing it. And note what the th reality is. There is no one outside oneself that can interfere with achieving that goal. I may have it that my idea to love people is to get here to Minneapolis, St. Paul, in order to give a conference. It may be that someone cuts me off in a car and I have an automobile accident and therefore I can't make it. Nothing. It remains the same. The goal of the Christian life is to love the people that are encountered as they are encountered. And that can be done just as well on the highway in Wisconsin as it can be done in an auditorium in St. Paul. Nothing can interfere with the Christian living the Christian life except the Christian. Otherwise, what? It wouldn't be good news. If I could interfere with your living, if I could interfere with your living the Christian life, what kind of life would that be? What kind of religious life would that be? But you say, I can make it difficult for you. Maybe. Maybe. But the nature of Christian spirituality, at least the spirituality that I know, is that when the Christian life becomes difficult, that is the moment when the Christian is being called upon to participate more fully in the redemption of the world. Because that's precisely the moment when the non-Christian would give up doing the kinds of things that the Christian is to continue to do. Temptation, in other words, is not threat. Temptation is opportunity. Opportunity to participate in the redemption of the world because of one's faith in Christ, because of one's belief in Christ, in a way that most people would not participate. They would give up at that point. And so, in thinking of all of this, huh? well, it seems to me one of the things that we have to kind of work with here is Jesus calls us to repentance, a change of mind. Part of that change of mind is, an enormous part of it is, the recognition that fear does not save. By the way, the commentary on that, the fear of God in Scripture is not fear with a gun at one's head. It's A-W-E, awe. Awe is what's being talked about with fear of God awe of God, reverence of God. And so, the change of mind that's necessary is tied into an understanding that fear does not save, that love saves. And where fear exists, love doesn't exist. Why? Because Christian love must be free to be Christian love. There is no such thing as compulsed Christian love. To force people to say, hey, say I love you or I'll kill you. I love you. What kind of love is that? What kind of virtue is that? You've just made the person a more fearful person. As John L. McKenzie says again, another place, on the necessity of freedom in the Christian life. He says, you have done nothing moral until you have done it yourself. You have done nothing moral until you have done it yourself. And so, in terms of all this, it seems to me there is one more question that we have to deal with. And that is the problem of authority in human community. Thomas Merton, in one of his writings, talks about the fact that down in Gethsemane, the monks kind of try to work in a spirit of collegiality huh? and communal decision-making and so forth. 
And he said one night they were uh, sitting there uh, around the table and they were discussing whether the monks should wear their cowls, their hoods, up or down during the readings, uh, during meals. And he said, you know, it's not really the most important problem in the world, but if you want to have a communal decision-making process, then it truly is important, whether you think it's important or not, to give yourself to it. And, uh, and you learn about other people and uh, their feelings on subjects if you really will participate. And so he was working at it. <clears throat> and, uh, and he started to listen. And what he was hearing was the subject somehow began to slip off of whether the cows, whether it was symbolically appropriate for the cows to be worn up or down, and subtly but surely what was taking place was the discussion now became so, so subtly a discussion of who was going to be boss in the monastery. And he said at that point there, he simply closed his eyes and started his Zen breathing. Nothing of any significance in Christianity happening anymore. Who is going to be boss is not a Christian category. In the world, in the world, organization of community is ultimately achieved by the use of dominative power in the secular world. the use of threat of one form or another to organize and order community, to sustain community. I'll say it and then I'll explain it. Jesus' teaching is that the principle of authority, of unity, of organization and cohesion in human community and in his community that is consistent with God's will is the principle or the dynamic that is embodied in the word diakonia. Diakonia is the technical word in the New Testament for authority. The best way I know how to do this is to quote you directly from Father McKenzie's book entitled Authority in the Church which, by the way, all his writings have imprimaturs on them. Now, that may not be important, but there are people who find it a very convenient way to reject the most sensible understandings of reality because they don't have imprimaturs on them. All his works have imprimaturs. They are consistent with the tradition of the church. McKinsey on the problem of leadership, Christian community, authority, I'll just read you the excerpted passages that I hope will make it clear. <clears throat> there is no successor to Jesus Christ in the church, nor could we think seriously of anyone carrying out his mission. There is no successor to Jesus Christ in the church because Jesus Christ has never left the church. He still lives in the church and exercises his headship in it. The only gospel passage in which Jesus sums up his ministry in a single sentence is found at the conclusion of a dispute concerning rank and place in the reign of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke have preserved the sayings. The sons of Zebedee, in Matthew it's their mother, asked for the two places next to Jesus in his glory. Jesus assures them of a portion of his cup but not of the rank requested. The petition initiates a dispute which Jesus settles quickly. He contrasts the domination of secular rulers with the attitude which his followers should exhibit. The greatest in his group should be the diakonos. The first in his group should be the slave. In this way, they will be like him, quote, and this is the single sentence that sums up Jesus' ministry. 
Just so the Son of Man did not come to receive service, but to rend the service and to give his life as a ransom for many. End of quote. I have left the Greek words diak diakonos in their original for the moment. The usual translation is minister or deacon, both of which have become ecclesiastical titles and therefore obscured of their original force. Diakonos means lackey, menial, or slave. When the abstract noun diakonia is employed, the best translation into English is service. Jesus' conception of his mission cannot be described as authoritarian. The feature which is emphasized is diakonia, and that to such a degree that secular conceptions of authority, listen to this, not only cannot be combined with his mission, but they are explicitly excluded from his mission. Jesus does not dominate human beings. He invites them to a free decision to love. The story of the temptations on the mount touch upon our problem. Only Matthew and Luke have the stories of the three temptations, and the order of the temptations is somewhat different. The offer of dominative power over the kingdoms of the world is placed third in Matthew, second by Luke. Jesus rejects the offer with a quotation from Deuteronomy in which it is commanded that worship be given to Yahweh alone. Certainly the story means that dominative power is not to be acquired at the price of the worship of Satan. But do we grasp the full import of the story if we think that the only thing wrong with the offer of this kind of power is that it has come from Satan. In the New Testament, the world, in the pejorative sense, is in the realm of dominative power and is under the authority of Satan. The reign of God is opposed to this power, and the struggle between the two reigns is constant and deadly. St. Ignatius Loyola made this the theme of the meditation on two standards in the spiritual exercises. <clears throat> like most Christian interpreters from early times, St. Ignatius did not question the implicit assertion in the temptation narrative that dominative power is Satan's to give. The offer is not rejected because Satan is unable to deliver what he promises. It is rejected because secular power is altogether inept for the mission of Jesus. Listen to this. Indeed, because the use of secular power is hostile to the mission of Jesus. Jesus did not need to use words like lackey, slave, menial, to describe the position of authority and leadership in his community. The vocabulary of both Greek and Aramaic is ample enough to permit a more restrained statement. If Jesus had wished to say that those in authority should rule with justice, there are a dozen ways in which he could have said it. But such words as rule are exactly the words he does not use. The sayings reveal a new conception of society and of authority, which must be formed not on the model of secular power, but on the mission of Jesus. Jesus left no instructions on how his church should be governed. He left instructions on how his church should not be governed. And that is according to the model of dominative power. 
As long as this corrupting influence is excluded, he seems to have very little interest in how the leaders of the church exercise their leadership. Jesus, and here's the central sentence, Jesus commissioned his church to find new forms and new structures for an entirely new idea of human association, a community of love. Jesus commissioned his church to find new forms and new structures for an entirely new idea of human association, a community of love. Lord Acton saying that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely is no more than a paraphrase of the gospel. Let me read you just one more paragraph from a man by the name of Donald Gelpy in a book called Discerning the Spirit. It's on the temptation to power over the kingdoms of the world. <clears throat> Gelpy is also a Jesuit. The third temptation is the most direct of all. It is the temptation to abdicate utterly the way of service and to choose in its place the way of temporal power and dominion. Next, taking him to a very high mountain, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. I will give you all these, he said, if you will fall at my feet and worship me. Jesus' reply is direct and unequivocal. Be off, Satan, for scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Thus, of the three temptations, the final one is the most crucial for a Christian understanding of the meaning of service. In it, Jesus is presented with two clear options. Either to continue upon the way of service which he has begun with a clear understanding of the risk and the suffering involved therein, or to seek instead the way of political and temporal power, the two ways are incompatible. To choose one is to abdicate the other. And Jesus' resolution of the conflict is unambiguous. He must abdicate the way of dominative power. For to do otherwise, to choose the path of this kind of power over the way of service, would be nothing else than to place himself under the dominion of those very forces of evil and chaos which he has come to conquer. What Jesus saw clearly in this final temptation then is this, that the renunciation of coercive power over people is inseparable from the sense and purpose which motivated him in his mission as son and messiah. To choose the path of dominative power as a means of accomplishing his mission would be effectively to abdicate his very sonship. It would be to abandon his salvific mission. I presume that most Christians most of the time in the last 1700 years have simply seen nothing inappropriate with the exercise of dominative power over their fellow human beings. In fact, it's something craved for, something religiously legitimatized. If McKinsey is right, with imprimata, it's not the dominative power is hostile to, is in for carrying out the mission of Jesus. Dominative power is hostile to the mission of Jesus. But think of the implications of the sentence. Jesus commissioned his church to find new forms and new structures for an entirely new idea of human association, a community of love.
dominative power governs the community of law, not the community of love. It is often said that war occurs when law breaks down. I submit to you, war is an extension of law. The same dynamics are employed in both. It's just for one reason or another, some parties have gotten tired of being subject to other parties' idea of how the world should run. So they're going to force their way of running the world on others. It's often said, I say this parenthetically, that the Battle of Waterloo was won in the playing fields of Eton. Perhaps the Battle of Waterloo was started on the playing fields of Eton. That is the spirit, the mind style, the consciousness, the desires it takes to compete in certain kind of sports are precisely the same thing that it takes to murder someone. Bishop Sullivan, a couple of weeks ago in Virginia, simply outlawed football in the Catholic schools. I don't agree with the way of doing it, but one can see, having spent eight years at Notre Dame and watched what goes on, one can see what happens to people. And the mechanisms that are begun there are simply mechanisms that don't stop at the end of four years. They're carried on out to other things. A serious matter, but so also with the mechanisms of hurt. If I say to you on the law, I will hurt you if you don't do this, I will hurt you if you don't follow what I say, I will hurt you, I will hurt you, it's only a matter of time before it's simply communicated that what a person needs in this world to run his own life or her own life is power, dominative power. And the more dominative power you have, the freer you are. And the less you have, the more unfree you are. So the task in this life is to get your hands on the ability to hurt so others won't hurt you and you can hurt them. And so the name of the game of the world is power. Christ commissioned this church to find new forms and new structures, an entirely new idea of human association, a community of love. Community of love is not a community of dominative power. To see what where the community of dominative power has taken us, I think that what we should do now is take a little break, just a short one, 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and see where the church has gone. From the time of Constantine, Constantine, in the year 312, you could not be a Christian and be in the fighting Roman army. 300 years of total nonviolence in the church, and the church grew in that world to be the largest religious body. In the year 312, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army and be a Christian. By the year 416, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army unless you were a Christian. In 104 years, it had totally reversed itself. Of the original ethic, 300 years of nonviolence, by the 8th century, we have a council saying, this is what's left of it. Actually, a synod saying, priests cannot use swords in war. They are limited to clubs. And of course, by the 12th century, we have the Crusades, where the Pope gave indulgences for killing a Muslim, plenary indulgences, straight to heaven for slitting a Muslim's throat. And that's a matter of history. And we have the Inquisition, the burning of people because they won't become Catholic. 
And finally, we have August 9th, 1945. A Catholic man drops an atomic bomb on the oldest and largest Catholic community in Japan, the original community founded by St. Francis Xavier, Nagasaki. And that's where Constantinian Christianity and the lust for dominative power and the religiously legitimatizing of it through the church has led. Three orders of nuns wiped out in nine seconds, evaporated off the face of the earth in nine seconds, 40,000 Catholics dead, hundreds of thousands maimed, done by a Catholic man, all in the name of Christianity. So when we return, we'll take a look at the dropping of that bomb.